Hello and welcome to Dialogue Sunday Gospel Study. Today is September 11th, 2022, and we have Stephen Peck with us today. For purposes of tracking with the Sunday School Come Follow Me program, this is the first of three sessions, three dialogue sessions, when we will work with parts of Isaiah. For today, the Come Follow Me programmed reading is Isaiah 1 to 14, 24 to 30, and 35. I'm Chris Kimball. I'm conducting today on behalf of the Dialogue Foundation. Uh, Rebecca Deschwinitz is with us with us today, and James Goldberg, I was going to say, has, will drop by, but James is with us already. Um, we are using our webinar format on Zoom. Now, after all that confusion, we're running a live stream on Facebook and recording this program. In the first issue of the journal, founder Eugene England wrote, my faith encourages my curiosity and awe. It thrusts me out into relationship with all creation and encourages me to enter into dialogue. To fulfill Gene's vision in the 21st century, now we have made the current journal, all 55 years of archived issues and all of our new digital offerings, including this program, our podcasts and other features entirely free for online users. This has been moving away from a subscription model and we now rely on donations. Um, we are building a sustaining dialogue fund and encourage you to contribute and help us build a fund for dialogue to continue into the indefinite future. You can find out more about sustaining dialogue at give to dialogue.com. No punctuation, give to dialogue period dot com. For our lesson today, um, I'm pleased to introduce Stephen Peck. And, uh, and then I'll turn some time over to him. Of course, I am, Stephen is an ecology professor at Brigham Young University. He's a fellow of the Neil Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship. He has published over 50 scientific articles in evolutionary ecology, philosophy of biology and religion. He loves best of all being a writer. He's won the Association of Mormon Letters Novel Award twice for the Scholar of Moab and Gilda Trillum and for short story once for Two Dog Pro Dose. His novel King Lear, Goat Herd of the LaSalle's, was a semi-finalist in Black Lawrence Press, early novel prize, and received a starred review from the Publishers Weekly. Steve has published two short story collections and two collections of essays. His poetry has appeared in New Myths, Pedestal Magazine, Prairie Schooner, Red Rock Review, Cold Mountain Review, Whitefish Review, and elsewhere. In 2021, he received the Smith Pettit Foundation Award for outstanding contribution to Mormon Leathers. His latest novel is Heike's Void, which was published just a few months ago. Um, currently, he's interested in recording the sounds of the world, birdsong, and in teaching an honors class. He's teaching an honors class on the music of birds and humans with Stephen Ricks at BYU. It's important to emphasize that as with every speaker and participant, we invited Stephen today for his personal insights, for his voice. He's not speaking for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He's not speaking for BYU. And even though we invited him and we are delighted to have him with us, he's, he's not speaking for the Dialogue Foundation. We're going to begin today with music from Philip Glass's Symphony No. 5. This will be the sixth movement, Evil and Ignorance, and um, Steve is going to tell us a little about this before we begin, but let me also say the opening prayer will be given after the music, the opening prayer will be given by Emily Peck, and I'm inviting you to start with the prayer as soon as the music's over. Um, Emily is, is, is Stephen's daughter, which I think might be her greatest claim to fame. She's a BYU graduate in Middle Eastern and Arabic. Uh, and uh, with a minor in Global Women's Studies. She's currently at the Yale Divinity School studying for an MDiv, a Master's of Divinity in Theology and Eco-Theology. Um, Stephen, uh, tell us about the music. Hey, I selected this music. Uh, uh, this is Philip's glasses, uh, homage to creation and to different traditions and scriptures. And this particular movement is about evil and chaos. And as the, the scriptures we'll be reading today and talking about deal with apocalypses, uh, I think this is an appropriate start. So the, the choral sections all involve 
readings from uh, other traditions. Uh, and, and I'll go over that. I, I want to go back after the prayer and talk a little bit about the, the, the words to this choral section, because I think they set the stage for Isaiah nicely. So we can go on from there. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we're grateful for this beautiful earth that we have and for all who live within it. We're grateful for humanity and also for non-humans in this world and help us to love and take care of each other and for all those in this world and help us to recognize how we treat each other and the earth and how we could be better stewards. We're grateful for the beauty and joy that we can find in this world and help us to recognize that it is more than just that. And we're grateful for our lives. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Steve, before you take over, uh, just a couple more housekeeping techie issues. Chris, can you switch on the chat for the audience and switch us to speaker view? Switch up to speaker view. And then there I think go. we're good. <laughs> okay. And, oh, I see chat. I, there, um. Everyone. Okay, go ahead, Steve. Thanks. Um, am I am I this on the view? Okay. Yes, you're the big you're the big picture. Okay, I want, I'm not on mine, and so I worried. <laughs> uh, so uh, thank you, Emily. I have to admit that the um, having your daughter give your the prayer and blessing was was fairly meaningful to me. I, I'm a lot like Chris, and then I missed up really easy. So we'll uh, we'll go on from there. Uh, the, these sections of Isaiah, I want to emphasize an aspect of it that I think gets downplayed, and I think is of major importance. And I, I'm going to talk a lot about it. In fact, and that's his that Isaiah is a poet, the, the, the Isaiah complex, and we have to look at it as a complex, uh, as, as, as several people have pointed out, that Isaiah actually is a, a kind of a, a collage of several cent centuries. And the, the, the part that we're going to read uh, today is is considered first Isaiah, but it has embedded in it elements of of other times and other people. But it's a coherent work. It, it Isaiah is in fact I just finished the Odyssey, and one of the things that that they talked about in in the introduction was that the Odyssey is a is a is a is a compilation of poetry that spans centuries coming from oral texts and from, from many sources. But there was something in its coherence that the, the people who brought it together, that redacted it into a single work, that they were committed to this voice of Homer. And this is a lot like Isaiah, that the people who create Isaiah, they had a love of Isaiah, they, had a, 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 they honored Isaiah, and they... They try to be true to his poetic sensibilities, which I think play into to why this is such an important and amazing work. I'm going to draw out some things that don't get drawn out very often, I hope. So I can share my screen, I take it. Let's see. It says the host is disabled participant sharing. <laughs> Steve, one more 
I, I realize I have to pass that over to you. And I, I take this responsibility very seriously, so I won't let you down. This is this is going to be this is going to be worth me sharing, maybe. <laughs> Probably not. Okay. Uh, let's see. That now you should be able to share. Hey. There we go. Look at that. So uh, for me, the most significant thing I want to talk about is, is Isaiah as a poet, as a prophet poet. And I think po poetry, as, as, I'll, as, as I'll show, I think is significant in understanding Isaiah, not just the form of poetry. There's a lot written on, on Hebrew forms of poetry but that poetic sensibility that la allows us to explore the world that lies outside of what can be verbalized or, or can be can partake of algorithms and all the things that, that we usually do when we're trying to, trying to uh, communicate directly. But poetry allows us to, or it should allow us to, to have the feelings that the poet's trying to capture expressed in ourselves. That's at least one of the goals of poetry and one of the, one of the, one of the things about poetry. We saw that in the uh, words that the, the choir just sang. This is from the Popol Vo. I'm not sure how to actually say it, but uh, it's talking about creation and it's talking about the, the, the appearance of people. And it, 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 it says, this is, this is a poem. Thoughts came into existence and they gazed. Their vision came all at once. Perfectly they saw, perfectly they knew everything under the sky, wherever they looked. Everything was seen without obstruction, this, this clarity of thought. And then it, uh, they began to abuse this knowledge. And so the bear took back their knowledge and breathed on it and their vision flickered and they couldn't see anymore and this 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 veil of ignorance that uh that that occurs uh, became a part of the reality that ignorance became one of the enemies of clarity hmm. not quite sure how to advance it there we go um th this section this this is one of my favorite sections all things O monks are on fire and what are all these things that are on fire? The eye is on fire, the ear is on fire, sounds, noise, everything's on fire. Fire of hatred, fire of infatuation with birth, old age, death. Uh, the, the Mahavega is, is describing the suffering of earth, the, the, the pain that, that we all experience. And then um, this final part from the Bhagavad Gita, uh, lost souls of little understanding rise as enemies of the world. This I have gotten today, and this desire I will fulfill. This wealth is mine, and that shall also be mine. That enemy have I killed, and others will I kill. I am the Lord of all. I enjoy. I am mighty and happy. I am rich of high bruth. Who is equal to me? And we're going we're gonna to visit some scriptures today that 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 look at this attitude that we're going to see this this kind of power mongering the 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 ability of worth to subvert what's good and what's right because we're living in a time similar to isaiah and i'm going to talk at length kind of about that and about what what um isaiah sees he he lives in a a terrible time and i want to add that i i, I feel like as we all do, as every age lives. And uh, I'll go on from there because I think we're facing an apocalypse right now in terms of, of climate change and in, in terms of the way we treat the earth. And I've asked uh, James Goldberg to come in. I'll quit sharing the screen and uh, allow him to read what I think. It, I, I have to say, uh, James is 
a poet's poet. He's one of my favorite poets. I love what he does. He he has he he ha, he is he is to me a bit of an Isaiah figure. He would probably disclaim the prophet part, but I I I add it. Uh, he he's he's his poetry captures things that I think are, are, are truth. And, and, and James, I, I, I don't have your, uh, um, uh, description of, of who you are and, but tell, tell them at least about the poem that you just wrote. It's amazing. It's in an issue of Ariantum and, uh, and, and get some excitement going about that because it's it's truly an amazing poem so james and then james is going to read a, a a poem about this moment this this moment uh of apocalypse that uh it draws on on themes from the book of mormon so uh james i'll, I'll let you take over that right yeah i'm jim goldberg i'm a poet in 2020 i released a collection called the book of lamentations that was reaching back into this biblical tradition of women. And yeah, kind of tapping in the thoughts from, from Isaiah and from contemporary Book of Mormon prophets, um, I mean, loosely contemporary, um, to, to speak to the moment now. And then I just released this other long poem called Song of the Salt Sea, that's in a long poetry issue from Mariantum that's also reflecting on what's what's this moment and yeah, the the biblical prophets interest in where do we stand in history what's our responsibility to ongoing history and how do we how do we prepare for these cycles of consequences that come is is really weighing on me and part of that poem and this poem i'll read which is called the book of mormon was written for our day Voice from the dust for a nuclear age, for a world leaning into its climate's change, for men gone mad with homicidal rage, which cannot be quenched with children's blood. Us, a lonely prophet carved coriantumers fake into plates of carnished gold. This is the truth he buried beneath us, that we are so very capable, choosing death, and choosing it, and choosing it, and choosing it until we grow numb, until even beaten, broken, breathless, our bodies will strain toward the consuming violence of a total self-destruction. Thank you. Thank, thank you, James. That's, that, that, that captures, I think, Isaiah better than anything I'm about to say. Uh, that that poetic sense that 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 we are we are in trouble. Isaiah lived in such troubled times. Uh, Isaiah was a a, a prophet of uh, during a time of destruction. The the Assyrian uh, Empire, one of the one of the strongest and greatest empires to ever rule the east, with with chariots aflame, were were wrecking havoc on the, the the known world at the time uh, and uh, let me back up uh, a bit uh, I want to read something uh, about another poet who lived in a time of war and this is from uh, and, and this this sets the stage for for poetry and for what I see is Isaiah's central theme and it it, it will it will sound surprising because you've probably never heard of it before but I'm, I'm going to try to explicit this is this is from um Cheslov Milo's uh, uh, book the witness of poetry and he, he's talking about what work poetry does in such times Mislos grew up essentially in the, the 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 scenes of destruction from from World War II. I read his biography, and he has. There were times where he's walking through the streets of cities as a child, and he's seeing dead bodies lining the road, people killed, people assassinated, and and I thought about my own childhood, and that's an experience I've never had. 
but I don't wonder if Isaiah had. And so this his his description of the work that poetry does, uh, I think I think is relevant. I think Isaiah grew up in such times, and one of the things that I think about Isaiah, it's 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 a beautiful book, and I I appreciate so much being asked by dialogue to, to give this lesson. I, I had focused largely sort of in my thinking about the future and about the current problems in Jeremiah, but Isaiah is absolutely rich. And I think about this poem that has existed for almost 3,000 years. It began almost 3,000 years ago. And what made it exist? What kept the poetry alive, uh, the, the story alive, was was I think his use of poetry, and in fact, uh, so we'll, I'll 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 go on from there. Let me let me make sure I'm on the screen. <laughs> um, he's writing about uh, this. This is in, in in the introduction to Measles book, The Witness of Poetry. Frankly, all my life I have been in the power of a diamond. A, dian, a daimonian, a, 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 like a, a powerful muse, a spirit. And now the poems dictated by him came into being, how the, the poems dictated by him came into being, I do not quite understand. That is the reason why in my years of teaching Slavic literatures, I have limited myself to the history of literature, trying to avoid poetics. Yet there is something that comforts me and justifies, I think, my presence in the chair of poetry at Harvard. I have in mind the corner of Europe that shaped me and to which I have remained faithful by writing in a language of my childhood. The 20th century, perhaps more protean and multifaceted than any other, changes according to the point of view from which we view it a point in the geographical sense as well, my corner of Europe, owing to the extraordinary and lethal events that have been occurring there, comparable only to the violent earthquakes, affords a particular perspective. As a result, all of us who came from these parts appraise poetry slightly differently from the majority of my audience, for we tend to view it as a witness and a participant in one of mankind's major transformations. I have titled this book, The Witness of Poetry, not because we witness it, but because it witnesses us. Both individuals and human societies are constantly discovering new dimensions accessible only to direct experience. This also applies to the historical dimension and we apprehend unintentionally and even against our will by experience. I mean not, only the feeling of direct pressure of history with a capital H in the form of fire falling from the sky, invasions by foreign armies or ruined cities. Historicity may reveal itself in a detail of architecture, in the shaping of a landscape, even in trees like those oaks close to my birthplace, which remember my pagan ancestors. Yet only an awareness of the dangers menacing what we love allows us to sense the dimension of time and to feel everything we see and touch, the presence of past generations. I, I think um, in, in a very real way, that could have been written by Isaiah. I, I think this idea of, of poetics bearing witness to us and, uh, and, and for us that these times, the things that have happened, and how Isaiah does that, I think is fascinating. Uh, uh, this book will figure in, in, in heavily into my thought today. It's called, There is Hope for a Tree. The tree is metaphors of Isaiah. And one thing that Isaiah does is he is filled with life. He's talking all about, about trees, about soil, about the land. He talks endlessly about, about that. He uses it as examples and as, as, as metaphor, metaphors. And um, uh, this is uh, Kirsten Nielsen's book, There's Hope for a Tree. She says something really interesting. The primary function of the text in the book of Isaiah was to assist 
the Israeli Jewish community to understand and accent what was the wish of the God of Israel. Isaiah preached that Yahweh intent, intended in the politically tense situation of the 8th century BC so that people might learn from it. His disciples passed on the message as they understood it on the assumption that it was still topical, usable. The prophet preached was uh, perceived as the living word of God and is not therefore surprising that this word could be used a number of times to interpret different historical situations. The chronicling and collecting of the traditions results therefore not from what we see as a historical interest in the past, but rather from the interest in the present and in the future. Uh, I think uh, James's poet, uh, poetry captures that. The Book of Mormon is written for a day in this moment, and Isaiah was too. And he filled it with life and with trees. And th there's several ways he uses trees that I noticed as I read. Uh, the, the themes of emergence and chaos emerge. We often try to, to talk about emergence and chaos as, as sort of cyclical events, like at one moment things are going bad and others are, are moving good. But the, 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 I, I, have to, I have to tell you why this interests me so much. Is most of my professional life, uh, most people don't know, but my, um, my, my PhD is in, in mathematics. And I spent a long time studying chaos and set with chaos groups and emergence. And I use those two to really understand ecologies, how chaos and emergence structure the way the living world works. And Isaiah picks up on this. He, he captures this. One of uh, my advisor wrote a paper that, that sort of made me want to choose him as my advisor about how he, he looked at hundreds and hundreds of, of, of species, population dynamics. And what he found was that species evolved to the edge of chaos. Species that were too regular, too embedded in one particular envi environment, didn't survive long. Extinction was the result. Those that go into chaos, it becomes random, and they, 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 they can't survive either. But those species that evolved to the very edge of chaos, so that they're, they're riding and these, these methods, uh, uh, chaos relies on some sophisticated mathematical theories that uh, I was going to spend about 20 minutes on, but I, I think I'll, I'll wait. But this is, this is the idea that, uh, that chaos and emergence are embedded together. They're, they're not part of a cycle. It's part of, of, of how things work. And Isaiah is going to claim through the use of trees and agriculture and forests in essence, that this is an ongoing process, that destruction and rebirth are simultaneously happening in, in, in the world. And so I'm going to focus on this agri agriculture. We'll, we're going to skip. There's some really lovely parts of Isaiah. I, I have come to adore it. That one in particular is when, uh, because there are these other, other infusions, emergence, chaos, flourishing, and destruction, imagination, and, 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 and method. Uh, remembering and forgetting uh, the, the one scripture you'll probably cover on another day, but just really moves me is, is when he, he says, can I'm, I'm paraphrasing, can a, a, a mother forget her child? I won't forget you because I've tattooed, I've tattooed Jerusalem on my hands and I won't forget. It's there in front of me all the time. It's tattooed. I love, I, I love that. I, I, I love that image of, of, God saying, will I forget? No, I've got, I've, I've got the reminder tattooed on my hands. There are the walls of Jerusalem. That's, that's so powerful and so, so meaningful. So this idea, this current of agriculture runs throughout Isaiah. And as I'll point out in more detail later, but just to kind of portend where this is going, one of the things that uh, Ellen Davis, uh, a Hebraicist, who writes about agriculture points out and uh, is often forgotten. We often talk about the everlasting covenant and we talk about the everlasting covenant 
as being between God and, and uh, Israel and Zion. But what she points out is that, that no, there's a third point, that the everlasting covenant, that's such a part of our theology and, and depth, was a covenant between humans and between God and between the land. And that piece Isaiah is replete with. It's everywhere. This, this, this tripartite covenant, the everlasting covenant, was not just about between God and people, but it was about God and people and the land. And the land as a resource that required stewardship and care. And so let's go to Isaiah and read some of these, and then we'll get to the, to the more destructive parts. Um, and I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Uh, does the plowman plow? He's, he's talking about, uh, about God. Give ear and hear my voice. Attend and hear my utterance. Does the plowman plow all day to sow, break open the harrow of his soil? When he levels its surface, will he not scatter fennel and, and broadcast cumin and set in rows barley in plots felt as a border? He guides them rightly. God instructs, for fennel is not beaten within the thrashing sedge, nor does the cartwheel roll. There was, there is a, a method to the stewardship that God requires of the land to fulfill the everlasting covenant. Um, and he goes on with this, talking about familiar things. Uh, he talks about the misuse of trees in, in, in cult, uh, disgracing, disgracing. So trees become both a, a, a metaphor for growth and regrowth and, and emergence, but they become a, 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 a part of, of misuse. Uh, this beautiful, beautiful, uh, so, and, and this is written at a time when Assyria is attacking the Northern Kingdom. Uh, Isaiah lives in Jerusalem and they're attacking. And, and what does Isaiah say that, that God wants? that God wants to create, one of God's aims is, and they shall grind their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not rise against sword against nation, nor shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the Lord's light. This, this obsession we see today with weaponry and with, with war, I think, uh, it, it, it belies the word of God, in a sense. Uh, the, 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 the motion for peace in all of Isaiah's writing is this other contrary that he, 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 he promotes. Isaiah is, is talking uh, about normative behaviors that we should work towards. They shall grind their swords. Remember the Lamanites that buried their swords. They took this seriously and enacted it. And Isaiah is talking about that this is what it means to walk in the light of the Lord. Um, uh, the Lord shall come in judgment with the, his people's elders and commanders. As for you, you have ravaged the vineyard and robbed from the poor in your homes. Why should you crush and grind the poor uh, and, and obey the word of the, of, uh, the Lord of armies? So Assyria is, 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 is rushing to destroy, uh, and the, Lord's, the Lord is, is condemning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go really fast because I know um, some of these things. But I go back to this. This beautiful uh, song, let me sing to my beloved the song of my lover for his vineyard. And it goes into this great de detail of caring for the vineyard. And um, in this book, there is hope for a tree. She emphasizes how, how this is a, is a call to seeing the land as a, a stewardship, a, a possibility. And this takes, this, uh, uh, takes the form of a, a lawsuit, actually. The, 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 the song of the beloved is, is, is presenting evidence that, 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 He's done all he can do to care for his vineyard. And so who gets condemned? And so uh, Rachel Whipple is a lawyer, so she'll, she'll be particularly interested in this, I hope. <laughs> um, uh, 
and he talks about about how how this is going to be taken away uh more about vineyards more about buds and flowers isaiah brings up again and again this idea of the land and what grows there and how people treat it um uh, the, the destruction that's coming uh the apocalyptic m metaphor of isaiah and one of the things that i took from this reading i just did of, of kirsten nelson about that we take isaiah I think this is important that we think about it in this way. How does Isaiah speak to our moment? Um, more about the wicked, more about not taking care of the poor. Uh, this, this, this is this is often read as a as a statement about uh, Satan in 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 later times, and this is appropriate. This is the way that 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 isaiah the many isaiahs who 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 brought together this commitment to his poetry his thought um all all embraced um uh, you you once thought in your heart to the heavens i will ascend above the eternal stars he's talking more directly to people about the king of assyria who is ravaging the land. And this is, I think, one of the most interesting uh, parts of this. And I'm going to skip way ahead. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, uh, let you go read Isaiah 24. This is the apocalyptic chapter. This, however, was not written at the time of first Isaiah. But this was written when Assyria had actually fallen and it fell very quickly. It was the most powerful nation in the world. They had, they had, they had conquered vast stretches of, of territory. Uh, and it was all going to disappear in a matter of a, of a few decades. Uh, all of it, all of this power came to naught. And it came to naught. Uh, and there were lots of contributing causes, but there's been a lot of research recently that shows what had happened was drought. Let me show you this. This is fun. It's not really a, a good, a good, good uh, Sunday school lesson unless you quote the primary literature and show intense uh, analyses of, of, of things. So this is from a paper that was published in Science Advances, the role of climate and the rise in the, in the I can't see the title because it's blocked because of the bar at the top, but the, the demise of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. What you see, what, what we're looking at is essentially, uh, uh, we're looking at essentially uh, drought. This is a proxy measure of doubt, drought and moisture falling. And what you see is that when Assyria rose was this time of great abundance of crops, all of these kinds of things. The Assyrian Empire was taking people from all over the place. Unlike the Babylonians, the Assyrians didn't let them keep their culture and they got kind of mixed in with the Assyrian culture. But suddenly, so this is uh, a time since the present. So roughly speaking, uh, this is the time that uh, that, that uh, the Assyrian Empire fell, and it fell as drought came in. Uh, what we see is is uh, this this expansion, and then and then it, it began to cause uh, wars and contentions everywhere. The, this is a, a, a thing we know from today that those places that that embraced drought interesting where you could see it most clearly was in the saline lakes in, of the region like our our great salt lake you could see this 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 powerful drought reflected in the concentration of salt in these lakes it, it became a, a, a really useful uh, indicator of drought and this drought was a century drought it was a multiple decade drought that occurred and um i won't belabor the point uh
so Isaiah does this. So I'm going to I'm going to uh, turn to it. Uh, it talks about the end of the earth, essentially, in 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 destruction and drought. Uh, I, I I so this Isaiah that wrote chapter 24 uh, is actually uh, writing at the same time as Jeremiah. And I I did a, a paper that looks at at this. It's on ships of Hagoth uh, that looks at the the, uh, the the conditions in Lehi's Jerusalem and Jeremiah's Jerusalem. And uh, Ellen Davis, Hebrew scholar, notes that the primary covenant between God and Israel was a covenant about and with the land. Its support and appears again and again in the Hebrew Bible. Judea was set in a dry, hilly country that did not enjoy the rich river valleys of the empires that surrounded them, like the Tigris and Euphrates Babylon, uh, of Babylon and the Nile River. And so King, King Ahab was the first king to really break the covenant with God. And he does it. He's not seen as one of the bad kings. But, he did, but uh, she details how King Ahab was the first attempt by a king who tries to subvert the land inheritance system that provided some measure of ecological stability. The people, the, the covenant with the land created agricultural systems that worked with the ecology, worked for it again and again. He exchanges land for gold and silver and other precious, I'm quoting Davis here, precious or useful metals like copper, tin, or lead. This leads to poverty and unequal distribution of wealth. The poor are no longer cared for. Women become object. And like the land, the, a commodity as wealthy men take on wives and concubines using the Isra Israelite kings as models. The covenant the Lord made with Israel was broken. So when now in Isaiah says they have violated an everlasting covenant, he is making the stunning claim that humans from their side have broken God's unilateral treaty that dates back almost to the beginning of the world against all logic and self-interest. They, the most powerful of us, the rulers of the fertile soil on the soil, on the soil have thrown back into God's face the post-Diluvian promise never to bring again destruction on the earth. Um, uh, and I just have to read this one, and then I'll I'll, I'll finish up. Um, a frightful and fearsome thing has come about the land. The prophets have prophesied falsely, and the priests held sway along with them. And my people love it so. But what will you do for its end? So there. This is, remember, this is Jerusalem around Lehi's time when there were lots of false prophets teaching. For my people are fools. We, we heard that in the opening symphony. Me, they did not know. Ignorant children they are. Ignorance and evil. And they are not discerning. They are wise to do evil, but they know not how to do good. I saw the earth. Now, the, Jeremiah here is rephrasing the, the book of Genesis, the opening uh, line is as is what we translate into empty waste as as welter and waste. I saw the earth, and look, welter and waste. The heavens and their light was gone. I saw the mountains and the look, and they quaked, and all the hills broke apart. It's a reversal of creation. Jeremiah is talking about the same as uh, Isaiah does, but a little more clearly, I think, this reversal of the of the, the creation. I saw and look, and there was no human there. And all the fowls of heaven had gone, and all the things that were created, the fowls of the earth, they're being taken away. I saw and look, the farmland was desert, and all its towns were ruined before the Lord in his blazing wrath. For among my people, wicked men are found. They watch as in a fowler's blind, and they set out in ambush. They capture men like a cage full of fowls, so their homes are filled with deceit. Therefore, they have prospered become rich. They have fattened and have thickened, even passed beyond the words of evil. They did not judge a just case, the orphan's case that should do well, the needy judgment they did not judge. It reminds me of this scripture from the Doctrine and Covenants. Behold, 
Verily, I say to you that in the consequence of the evils and designs which do and will exist in the hearts of conspiring men in the last days, I have warned you. This was the same situation that Jeremiah is decrying and Isaiah are decrying. Um, let's talk about today. Uh, if you listen to Doug Fabrizio's talk about the condition of the late last, its current condition, what we see is like in the Assyrian Empire, our Salt Lake is drying. It's becoming more haline. It's reached the point where in laboratory experiments, which always aren't accurate, the creatures who live there, the brine shrimp and the, the, uh, the, uh, the brine flies that, that feed thousands and mil millions, millions of birds uh, are dying. This, this lake is going to become a death bowl if it doesn't, something doesn't happen. It's, 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 it's due to both climate change. This is from a, a New York Times report on the condition of the lake that, that things are, got, are bad. In our own backyard, Utah Lake, uh, uh, we, we saw in, in Jeremiah and Isaiah, who wrote chapter 24, this sense that the powerful and the rich were trying to do immense damage to, to enable their wealth to grow at the destruction of, of what was there. I have a long history with this lake, by the way. This is me. And what we see, uh, just to give you a sense of what's happening with the lake, I think a lot about the birds. Friday night, this is a report from Friday night, there were nearly a half a million migratory birds flying over Utah at night. We don't see them, but they travel and, um, and, and come through at night. Uh, these are the birds that they probably are. The rate, the, the, this is, this is uh, sensed by radar. They can pick out individual birds, but they can't tell, for example, warblers and, and, and uh, Western king birds apart. But this is a tremendous resource. W right now, we are on the break of the kind of drought that brought down the Assyrian nation, a nation that, that spent more than the combined armies of all the rest of the world on military. But what brought them down? What destroyed the Assyrian uh, army, as Isaiah details, was greed and avarice and an unrecognizable attention to the land that Amos destroyed the land through his, his, his attention, enacted the, the buying and selling of land, which was against the Lord's covenant to his people. And so we're, we're, um, I want to leave with a poem, since this is, a, this is about poetry in some sense. Uh, this is a, 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 a piece that was um, published in uh, Penembra. Uh, with the work of Jackie Leishman. This is her picture. And we talked about this. We, we spent a, a, a long time thinking about the, the troublesome fire. Uh, Dialogue Zone, Andy Davis, uh, lost an immense amount in that fire. And these are becoming more common. The West is burning. All these things are due to the changes in a climate, the droughts, the, the floods in inappropriate places. These are the sorts of things that bring down empires and civilizations. And I think Isaiah's message to us is return to thinking about the land, return to thinking about how we use the land, how the land keeps us alive, keeps us going. So I'll, I'll just read this this poem. Listen, what do you hear at night? Wind, rain with rich overtones of complexity is the sound of falling water on leaves on understory, drips from different heights, mixing at different frequencies and harmonics and chaotic temperaments of splashing wonder, frogs in ponds calling, owls hooting to help a mate locate their nest, or do you hear the million decibel crackle of fire, the blazing turbulence of flames whooshing upwards, the crack 
of bark separating from boiling cambium, the pop of forest insects, the maelstrom of a full canopy of pine needles being consumed as quickly as a single piece of tissue paper laid on a blazing campfire, the sound of a world ablaze, the sound of white, hot, red, and dark gray smoke portending nights. So in closing, I think Isaiah's message to us and Jeremiah's that the everlasting covenant that God made with humans was not just with, between God and humans, but between, between God's, between God, humans, and the land. And that, I think, is why it's important to, to study Isaiah. We need to co-opt Isaiah for our day, as Nephi did. He grabbed it, and, and whatever its, its, its construction, Nephi used it to construct something new. We need to construct sort of a new story about, about how greed destroys, how wealth misapplied to the land destroys, how, how our connection with everything that matters to us right now is conditioned on the land. And so I, I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. I would like to call on Rachel Whipple for closing prayer. Rachel thinks of herself as a lapsed stay-at-home mom. When she was home full-time, she spent years exploring LDSI's ideas of environmental stewardship in both writing and household management. Um, she, as the kids got bigger, she went back to school to study environmental humanities and then environmental law. Now she practices law in Provo and serves on the Provo City Council. Hooray. Um, uh, where she gets to think about sustainability for the entire community. Rachel? Yes. Almighty and everlasting God, you made the universe with all its marvelous order and all its creative chaos, its atoms, worlds, and galaxies, and the infinite complexity of living creatures. You set in creation a world of life and death, of birth and decay, with cycles of dissipation and renewal. Grant that as we probe the mysteries of your creation, we may come to know you more truly and more surely fulfill our role in your eternal purpose. Almighty God, in giving us dominion over things on earth, you made us fellow workers in your creation. Give us wisdom and reverence to use the resources of nature so that no one may suffer from our abuse of them, that generations yet to come may continue to praise you for your bounty. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I'm going to stop the recording and, uh, and take us off live Facebook, but I hope you'll stay with us and have some additional conversation.